FY 2025 earnings call of Hinduja Global Solutions Limited. From the senior management, we have with us today Mr. Partha Desarkar, Executive Director and Group CEO, HGS, Mr. Vinsley Fernandez, Full Time Director, HGS, and Head of Digital Media Business, Mr. Srinivas Palakodetti, Global CFO, HGS, and Mr. Amal Chintopant, Head of Finance, HGS Media. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during this conference, please signal an operator by pressing star and then zero on your touchtone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Darshan Mankat from Ad Factors PR. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thank you, Darwin. Uh, good evening, everyone. I welcome you to the earnings call of Sendija Global Solutions Limited for the second quarter and half year ended September 30, 2024. Before we begin the earnings call, I would like to mention that some of the statements made during today's call might be forward-looking in nature, and hence it may involve risk and uncertainties, including those related to the future financial and operating performance of the company. Please bear with us if there is a call drop during the course of the conference call. We would ensure the call is reconnected the soonest. I would now hand over the call to Partha, sir, for opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, and very good evening to all of you. Before I start, I want to do an audio check. Am I audible? Uh, sir, you are loud and clear, sir. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much for confirming that. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be with you again for our, call, for our earnings call, conference call for quarter two. There is a presentation out there on our website, which we will refer to as we speak during our conference call. So, there is the usual uh, uh, safety statement about uh, the future uh, statement, uh, future looking statements that we will make. And after that, we'll get into our introductory slide, which is slide four, which talks about the company at a glance. We are a global leader in optimizing customer experience, digital transformation, business process management, and digital media ecosystem. So there are lots of stats out there. People who have known us for a while. I'm not going to go through all the details out here. Suffice to say that we had three very strong businesses that we manage. I'll go to slide five, which talks about uh, the financial performance. Quarter two, FY25, our total income stood at rupees 1,207.6 crores. There's approximately 144.4 million. Our operating revenues were at 1,087.2 crores, about rupees 130 million. And our total EBITDA was rupees 157, 154.8 crores, which is US dollar 18.5 million. EBITDA margins were at 12.8%. If you take the full YTD for the first half of the year, when the total income stood as rupees 2,426.2 crores, that is rupees 290.2 million. Our operating revenue was at rupees 2,179.1 crore, which is 260.7 million. And the total EBITDA was 298, uh, 298.3 crores, which is US dollar 35.7 million. EBITDA margins were at 12.3%. Key highlights that I'd like to call out, I'm on slide six now. We continue to see challenges from a revenue growth and a profitability because revenue growth has been muted. There are macroeconomic economic pressures, there are election uncertainties, delays in decision making on awarding contracts, and drop in revenue from the UK business. Hopefully, the two of the large elections now over and a change of government now firmly in place, we will see clarity on direction and therefore decision-making will become faster in the second half of the year. Our engagement with existing clients and the pipeline is actually quite healthy. We signed two new contracts in North America yeah, with core technology services. So this is a point that I'd like to call out. 
that our technology services have been used are actually starting to do very, very well. You know that we tried to, uh, we have been in our journey to increase the digital component of our revenues, and I am happy to state that the two wins that we have are significantly core technology driven. Similarly, our agent text, which is our AI driven platform for customer experience transformation, that has run for the UK G Cloud Framework Submission. That means the entire UK public sector can use G Cloud for their services. So that's a big win for us. It almost opened up the market for technology services for us, uh, consisting of 24 large UK public sector and 317 provincial government services. Very exciting with this win. This, is, uh, this happened early in October, November. And though we are yet to pick up uh, revenue from this particular win, it qualifies us for bidding for the UK public sector. Our Australian business, AGS OSS, is seeing strong growth. We're making up showing trend to India by our Australian clients as well. New geographies and Colombia and South Africa are tracking well. Uh, the promising pipeline for South Africa. Cybersecurity services, we just entered into cybersecurity services with seven new solution offerings. These are all AI led, and that's the new thing about our services. In cybersecurity, everyone has a solution, we have an AI power solution. As I mentioned, in the UK public sector, Alien Tech is our big differentiator in winning new business with clients. It has been deployed over 16 clients across Canada, US, and Jamaica. And as we move into more technology driven services, we are focusing on skills training for employees with an emphasis on digital. I'll move to the next slide, which gives you a snapshot of our Cape Town operations. So you see the building on the top right, it is a campus uh, on Windsor in Cape Town. It is a site for the famous Treaty Tree, uh, which is well known for its association with Dr. Mandela. South Africa's business case is that it provides about a 40 to 60 percent savings per FT. Today we have about 136 states that have been built up. But there are four floors if and when demand picks up, we can quickly add floors and seats. We support four languages, English, German, French, and Dutch. By date, you would have seen some publicity around our AI hub launch in the uh, Philippines. It is a state-of-the-art facility where we are experimenting with our AI um, service offerings. It is an interactive space where clients, partners, and employees can leverage advanced technologies of automation, analytics, and AI. We have a virtual reality, visual AI, and speech AI, all these technologies on display to uh, show things to our clients what we can do for them. So very excited with that. The most important uh, recognition that one can talk about is the recognition that we've got from IMG for wilder lens, creating alien tracks as uh, in leader squadron for intelligent agent experience and intelligent CX, AI, and analytics. You'll see that in slide, you'll see that in slide nine. Uh, we are on the leader squadron with the top right hand. So our strategy focus continues to remain the same. We are vertical specific business and we are driving point solution towards the end. Lean ops with intelligent automation, cost effective clouds, experts on demand. Uh, leaning into the potential of applied AI, most of our AI solutions are actually catered to client-specific business environment. Our AI is night, powered by a power partner ecosystem, Indian text, which is now being customized for verticals that we are servicing, and the dedicated AI lab. I talked about talent management. Uh, as we steer the company into more and more digital frontiers, we are going through a massive reskilling exercise for our employees across the Colombia, South Africa, Philippines, and India to train them on AI and technology skills. 
The last five chapters, what we're talking about are bringing digital and traditional business together in the intersection of these two cycles, which we are calling digital operations, which is AI-driven process management, process improvement, unattended customer service using conversational bots or interactive voice agents, attended customer service where the human is in the loop and therefore is continuously watching transactions that uh, transactional IVA driven by AI are continuing to have, and AI ops, which is data tabbing labeling. So this is the middle part of the intersection of our TX business and our digital business, whereas on the two extremes, we will have a conventional digital business, which is app development, maintenance, cloud, system integration, etc., and the traditional CNC is contact center with any works of deployment, non the back office, and the technology you see as a job tree. <clears throat> so that is the end of my section of the presentation. I will hand it over to you now, Pierre. Vince, to take you through the digital media business update. Vince, over to you. Thank you, uh, Parto. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. And um, again, welcome to the uh, call on the Q2 earnings of FY25 and H H1 as well. Um, I'm going straight to slide 13. I hope everyone can hear me. Darshan, can you all confirm if my audio is too? I'm assuming it's it's clear. Uh, so this is the yeah, thank you can hear. Great, great. Thank you. Um, I'm going straight to slide 13. I normally don't dwell too much on uh, on industry and environment. Uh, but this time I thought it's important because uh, I'm sure a lot of you have been reading in the press and watching on television uh, that there's this, this huge, um, exciting uh, opportunity around the corner called uh, broadband over satellite or basically receiving internet from space, from a satellite. And um, full, full, complete kudos to the government of India um, to push this uh, actively and effectively what it will do is it will provide connectivity to underserved and rural markets in the country. So what's broadband over satellite, just to kind of dumb it down and I'm, you know, just, just to let you know, it's like, um, imagine a tiny little dish on your rooftop or even on your balcony or even on top of your car. Um, and um, there are satellites overhead which provide you broadband. So effectively, you're not connected to any wire, you're not connected to any medium. There's just a little satellite dish connecting to your um, device in your home where you can receive broadband or you can receive internet connectivity. So this is a, 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 great, um, a great model for the future. The reason why I chose to dwell on it is because if you'll recall, um, a couple of um, month, a couple of quarters ago, uh, even over a year ago, um, one OTT Entertainment Limited, our broadband vertical, has been working on this. We have conducted, and I shared this in our investor calls as well, we have conducted tests in places like Tawang in Arunachal Pradesh, uh, in Pulwama in Jammu and Kashmir, where we actually tested uh, using this technology in terms of how it could bring education to remote parts of the country and bring infotainment. And, um, you know, if you look at this slide, and, and this is all thanks to news that is available in the, in the marketplace, uh, the, the best part about it is that suddenly um, access to education, healthcare, uh, the public services of the government, e-commerce, suddenly becomes available everywhere, right, all across the country. And your company that is one OTT Internet Limited and the fact that we've got this amazing, uh, through Next Digital, we're already connected in about 65% of rural India. Um, we're really excited about the opportunity this provides for us. Um, this is a sea change and for us is probably the next big thing that will happen as we look to obviously partner, become a service provider to the large global players who are looking at this space. Um, so stay, stay posted for more news on, on this subject. Um, going to slide 14, I'd shared in the last quarter that there were a couple of initiatives that we had rolled out. I thought it was important to update all of you with the progress on that. Um, if you look at one business, one business was essentially a product that we've rolled out um, through a proof of concept in uh, parts of Mumbai in August. And the idea was, listen, we're sitting on so much of connectivity. How can we leverage it to offer our existing network to, you know, to offer commercial broadband? 
mainly to the MSME and the SOHO segment. SOHO segments are is basically the small office, home office. You're talking about lawyers, doctors, uh, chartered accountants, um, designers, people working from home. And um, we ran this proof of concept and we've been able to successfully carry out. We signed on some very, very nice clients in the last quarter itself, right from Kalyan Jewelers to the Prestige Group. And uh, the POC has been successfully completed and we're looking to roll it out across key markets. Essentially, again, we're providing quality broadband, quality connectivity to markets across um, MTN. And then as things kind of pan out, we look to expand it across to the rest of India. Um, I also shared with you that there would be effectively um, two offerings. One would be the simple Business Connect offering, and there would be a Business Connect Pro. So this is a ILN or internet lease line. It's a dedicated connection for customers and with much higher SLAs and a dedicated customer care team. So that is on one business. One seven star, as I shared with you, was the, um, was the relationship we forged early this year. And the strategy was effectively to work with a strong partner and grow the business in certain key markets. Uh, we, as you know, took on a... Uh, majority acquisition of leading Mumbai-based ISP Seven Stars Broadband business. And this has uh, been uh, an exceptional time for us. Uh, we've rebranded the business as One Seven Star. So if you see the graphic on your screen on slide 14, the Seven Star Digital is now One Seven Star. And um, it's been doing very well. Um, I thought it pertinent, again, just to keep you all posted. And in fact, slide 15, if you'll go to slide 15, it's the branding and communications that we've rolled out in quarter, well, quarter two mainly, um, rebranding um, it for not just uh, existing customers, but also the pitch to new customers. So we've um, come out with graphics all over, hoardings, bus stops, uh, T-shirts for the teams, a new portal, new website. And um, we hope any of you who is a customer of Seven Star in the past is now enjoying the one Seven Star experience. And um, we believe that this is a, another very strong activity that we embarked upon, and we plan to see it grow significantly as we go forward. In terms of where we are, this slide 16 is by far a very critical one, and I wanted to share it with you because I distinctly recall a question at the end of the Q4 um, analyst call where um, when we presented growth, well, we did over 28% last year, if you recall, in terms of subscriber base. And I categorically mentioned that our focus this year would be on improving profitability and moving to a strong profitable base. Um, and if you look at this graphic, if you look at the graphic on the left, uh, we are focused on churning low yield customers, customers where we really weren't able to make any money. These were low revenue customers. And instead of that, we focused on improving the quality of service and therefore driving the broadband ARPUs or average revenue per user. So while we're seeing a trend across where revenues ARPUs are either going down or remaining flat, we're quite happy that we've been able to grow from 174 rupees ARPU last year uh, in Q2 to 189. I think the more important thing is that, again, which I had mentioned at the end of the um, Q4, uh, at the end of FY24 analysis, is that our focus would be on ensuring our uh, mix, our revenue mix, or our product mix would be sufficiently diversified. So as to not so not just reduce the dependency on the retail segment, which as you know would have ARPUs that would face challenges going forward, but more importantly would cater to a diversified uh, set of customers which have greater duration of longevity and greater um, greater ARPUs as well. And if you look at the pie chart there, um, we've been able to achieve that in H1 of this year, where today 10% of our top line for H1 comes from our enterprise segment. Um, that, is, that is very good, and we look to expand that even as we look to expand the pie. And the new managed service model, which again I would mentioned in the last quarter presentation, um, that we were looking to a focused alliance with, um, with triple players in alliance, um, 
we already it already accounts for around five percent of the top line, not just Triple Play but other partners as well. And we believe that this is the future going forward. Um, strong collaboration, leveraging our expertise in technology, leveraging our expertise in network, uh, having the best people on board, and being able to support smaller ISPs in their growth story, managing their businesses to them, and obviously a win-win situation for. Um, the managed service partner as well as for our company. And that is also a factor in digital television. Uh, we've continued to improve our yield. There's been a slew of measures. If you look at the graph on the right hand side, um, everywhere we're promoting our uh, mixed product or our integrated product, which is digital television plus broadband uh, plus OTT. So overall, um, you know, our, our focus is quality revenue customers across DTV and broadband. We know that there are challenges in the market, challenges in the industry, but I think what always um, has kept um, the entire Hinduja global solutions apart from the rest is our ability to innovate and leverage technology um, you know, for tomorrow. So I think we've been able to do that pretty well. It's, a, it's undoubtedly an uphill task, but we'll keep on pegging away at that. Um, with that, I think I'd, I'd, I'm done at the end of my uh, presentation, and uh, that was slide 16. And I'm now going to hand over to uh, Pala, Srinivas Pala Kodetti, who's our global CFO. Uh, thank you all for listening patiently. Much appreciated. Pala, over to you. Thank you, Vince. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this q 2 n call. Uh, I hope my voice is uh, clear and yeah, loud and clear. Yeah, thank fine. you. Vince. Loud and clear. Okay. I'm on slide 18. This is the revenues performance for the quarter ended September 24. So, on a year on year basis, there is a drop in revenues by roughly about 8%. Uh, the drop in revenue on the BPM side is about 13%. And on the media side, the revenues are up by about 10%, uh, which is leading to the overall drop of 8%. And this drop in revenues is primarily due to reduction in revenues from our UK business, uh, again, primarily from the UK sector. So for the first half of, for the <clears throat> quarter ended, uh, actually for Q1 and Q2 of the current year, the BPM business accounts for around 71 to 72 percent, and the media business is about 28 percent. And compared to the same period last year, it was about 78 percent was coming from the BPM business, and about 22 percent was coming from the uh, media business. On the uh, margin side, our EBITDA margins uh, have shown an improvement on a sequential basis up from 11.8% to 12.8%, but lower than where we were uh, a year ago, where the margins were about 15.9%. Uh, one thing to call out, uh, in case between Q1 and Q2 on the current year, there is a decline in other income. While that is primarily because of the uh, exchange rate fluctuations, in Q1, we had an FX gain of about 8.3 crores. And in Q2, that became a loss of 8.9 crores. So on, on the other income side alone, there is a swing of about 17.2 crores, primarily on the account of the FX uh, variation. And this is primarily happening because of the, uh, you know, as a global company, our revenues costs are accounted into uh, multiple currency. And as you know, uh, FX movements have been pretty volatile, not just between USD and INR. It's also been volatile between USD and GBP, as well as USD and GMT. Practically all our currencies have shown volatility. Mm. Uh, what, moving on to the next slide, on a half yearly basis, our revenues are down by about 5.8%. And at the P8 and at the EBITDA margin, we are down from about 15.6% to 12.3%. Uh, 
VAT for the first half of the year, including profits from the discontinued operation, came in at about 111 crores, substantially higher than what we had at 35.1 crores for the first half of the previous financial year. Moving on to slide uh, 20, this is on the balance sheet. Uh, our balance sheet continues to remain strong. Our network as of September is over 7,828 crores. Uh, there is an increase in the DSO days between uh, March 24, which was a 25 day, uh, 62 days, to 65 days at September 24. Uh, clearly, there is seasonality. You can see what happened last year from September 23, Q2 FI24, where it was 67 days. It has come down to 62 days. So we have no concerns on our receivables. All our uh, clients are well-established and strong customers who pay us. The other thing to call out is on the debt side, between March of 24, when we had total debt of 1,306 crores, that debt has reduced by 49 crores to about 1,257 crores as of 31st of 30th of September. So we have been able to reduce our total debt during the current first half of the financial year. Moving on to slide uh, 22, we said this is on the cash flow side. Key thing to call out is uh, during the first half of the year, our capex stands at six, close to 66 crores, which is roughly about five crores lower than the same period last year. So we are being prudent about our capex, and also this mix is being determined by the type of business which we are doing. Uh, other thing, only other thing to call out is the we had some payments to be made for the teching acquisition, which continues to perform well. So there were some earnout payments, and during the year we paid out roughly about 129.5 crores towards the teching acquisition. <clears throat> Moving on to slide 22. As I said, our balance sheet is strong. We have shareholder funds of about 7,083 crores. And our total uh, net cash and treasury surplus, which is total cash and treasury surplus, net of debt, that stands at 5,090 crores. And if you see between March and September, there is an increase of about 77 crores on a net treasury and cash surplus being driven by reduction in debt as well as increase in the overall gross in uh, treasury and cash surplus. So we are a strong we have a strong position on the balance sheet side. Coming moving to slide 23, this is on the uh, revenue split. Our CX services account for about 57 percent and our digital and media business accounts for uh, 43% of the revenues. Within this 43%, so about 21% of the total revenues come from the digital services, what Partha referred to in his slide of digital business, as well as from the digital operation business. The CX services share has remained fairly constant in the range of 57% between Q1 of this year and Q2 of uh, this year. Though the digital revenues have shown a slight increase of the total revenue. Moving on to slide 24, this is the revenue by origination and by delivery. You would see that the UK business, uh, from an origination perspective, UK business is around 12%. This has shown a decline from what it was in the earlier periods for reasons you mentioned early in our early calls. We had a lot of revenues coming in from related to COVID. And with COVID behind us, some of those revenues have also dropped, uh, have tapered off and dropped. So the share of UK revenues has come down. The India revenues of 36% com comprise the media business 
the HRO business and we do have some clients on the digital side who are from India, primarily a subsidies of clients for whom we do work overseas. From a delivery point of view, India accounts for about 40%, US is about 23 and Canada and uh, UK at 13% and 10%. Philippines comes in at 12%. <clears throat> we expect as we grow to have, uh, Partha mentioned South Africa, we do expect that to go going forward, looking at the fact that operations have started in the current quarter and the pipeline looks promising. Moving to the next slide, this is revenue by vertical. The tech and media and telecom sector, that has not changed. That's been at the range of 55% between Q1 and Q2 of this year. Uh, as far as the public sector is concerned, this clearly has shown a dip. Uh, it was in the range of about 12% earlier. That has come down to 12 uh, to about 8%. As I mentioned, uh, this is primarily from the UK sector, UK business, where revenues have dropped from quite a few of the uh, public sector clients, primarily on the healthcare side, the, uh, related to COVID. BFSI has shown an increase and stands at 16%. Consumer and retail have also shown an increase at 13%. Some increase in the others. So that's the broad breakup in terms of our total uh, revenue split for the quarter. On the, moving on to slide 26, this is the client concentration. Uh, the top customer accounts for about 10.6%. This is from the BPM business. Uh, top five accounts for about 24, and the top 10 customers account for about 32%. Uh, these all come from the uh, BPM business. Uh, the most, a lot of the digital business, the media business, are, uh, clients are from the retail side. Uh, but we do expect that to change, as Vince mentioned, that we are going to focus more on the corporate as well as the small office businesses, semi-corporates for the broadband business. On the DSO side, there is, uh, as I said, an increase between March 24 to September 24, uh, as well as from June 24 to June 25. But as I mentioned in the earlier slide, this stood at about 67 in September 24, sorry, September 23. That came down to 62 days in March 24. And has come down to 65 uh, as of September 24. So roughly a two, uh, two DSO day reduction between September 24 and 25. And more importantly, as I mentioned, that we have a strong client base and, and who are financially strong. And so we have uh, no discomfort or any concerns on the receivable side. Uh, this is pretty much my last slide. So I would now like to open uh, the Q&A session and also back to Darshan for moderating the Q&A session. Thank you everyone for listening to me. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchtone telephone. If you wish to withdraw yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to please use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We have the first question from the line of Dheeraj Kumar, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Um, thank you for taking my question. Uh, I would like to know the current revenue contribution from the cybersecurity services and one business, one stock. And what is the contribution that we are looking forward in maybe the coming uh, two or three years? Bala, you want to talk about the cybersecurity aspect? Uh, thank you for your question. 
uh, cyber security is something which we have uh, started only in the current financial year. Uh, so revenues at this stage are not, in the current quarter, are not uh, significant. But this is an area which looks promising and we expect that to grow uh, going forward. It may take a year or two to build up some scale, but this is an area of uh, large growth potential going forward. Wouldn't you want to take the one of yeah, sure, to understand sure. uh, precise number? Is it is it uh, one crore, ten crore? Do you have any precise number for cyber security, even if it's not significant? I need. To, I don't have it offhand, to be honest. So I need to check, and I'll have to come back. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, and sir, uh, one business, one star. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, sir, one seven star is actually um, more a joint venture where they had an existing business itself. Uh, the idea of strategically partnering with them is um, is not is not so much financial, but it's strategic in being able to expand in markets. So rather than looking at it from a revenue perspective, we're looking at it from a reduced cost of acquisition. Um, so my cost of acquisition, if it is X in parts of Western Mumbai, it reduces significantly by about 20 to 25 percent. Um, that's how one seven star works. On one business, your question is absolutely valid. Um, it's a new product that has been rolled out. The ARPUs for such a business, I can share with you, the ARPUs are closer to about 10,000 rupees quite easily uh, for a link. Um, what will be the quantum of value? We've only completed a POC which has given us about 17 to 24 odd links. Um, we're just rolling it across um, Mumbai uh, in the first phase, and then uh, Mumbai, Thane, Navi, Mumbai, and then taking it to other cities. So I think by the end of Q4, um, we will see traction from Mumbai, Thane, Navi, Mumbai, and then onwards to the other markets. And oh, what is the contribution uh, that we are looking forward, maybe in the coming three years? Uh, we, I'll tell you, we just did a POC, right, in, in August, sir, right? It was a three-month POC, which was August, okay. September, October. So we're still in the process of firming up a business plan. But uh, as I mentioned to you, and if you look at the pie chart, uh, our idea was more to ensure that our dependence on the retail sector reduces. To what quantum? That is a bit of a difficult thing to, to mention right now. But I can promise you this, that we will definitely be in a position to give you a much better uh, sense once it's commercially rolled out in the, um, towards the end of Q3. So by Q4, uh, we'll be able to give you actual numbers, sir. Okay, I understand. Fair enough. You know, the reason I'm asking this question, because since the past 12 quarters, the company's earnings have remained stagnant, um, almost at the same level. And it's reflecting in the share price. Our share price is right. uh, three-year low, and we would like to know, you know, if uh, the company is working on it in new, which yeah. could increase uh, revenue in uh, future, and that's also um, lifted uh, for all the investors. Absolutely, sir. Um, and uh, my last question regarding the financials: I see that we have borrowings of around 100 crore. Uh, but I don't see the reason why we have this debt when we have uh, so much of cash flow in our balance sheet. You know, the the interest that we are paying is reflecting on the profit and loss statement. And there are many who just uh, read the profit and loss statement and invest or sell the uh, you know the, the stock. So, um, what what is the reason behind this? Uh, let me take that good question. So the numbers that we have presenting are at a consolidated level, whether it is debt or debt treasury tax. But you know, the a lot of the cash is uh, come from the sale of the India sale of the healthcare business, and that money is outside uh, India and earning reasonable returns uh, from a dollar from a dollar return perspective. Uh, by technically, you could bring in money into India, and bulk of the money in India has been used for buyback, transaction cost, uh, other growth initiatives. But if you bring the money back uh, to, to India, 
you will end up having a large uh, tax in the form of tax on dividends. And so that's one of the reasons coming in the way of bringing all the money back to uh, India. There would be tax, a lot of tax and efficiency which would come in. Yeah, yeah, totally fair. I think uh, that's, uh, that's a good way to look at it. And uh, how how are we going? To, what are the plans to use that money? Because it's been a long time uh, after the sale of the business. And are we planning any acquisitions or are we planning any expansion? Or will it just stay invested and we will only gain the interest on it? No, so uh, good question. Uh, so if you go, go back to what we have done, uh, we did the soon after the sale of the healthcare business, we acquired um, a business called Diversify. Uh, then we acquired a business called TechLink in uh, USA. Uh, that acquisition happened in the month of, I and mean, it happened in end February of 2023. So currently, we continue to look for uh, opportunities for growth. Uh, it could be, you know, like we started operations in Colombia and South Africa, or it could be through acquisition. So we continue to look for acquisition, uh, which fit what we want to do, and more importantly, valuations which make sense. And these two acquisitions uh, that we have done, are they in the same domain of providing, uh, uh, you know, IT or IT management uh, services, or are they, do, they, do they belong to a different business? So the business, TechLink, which we acquired, uh, that's into, primarily into analytics. So which is part of our overall plan to grow the digital operations and the digital service. Uh, the other acquisition that we made uh, is called Diversify. It is an Australian company. Uh, it is into uh, the traditional offshoring um, and, uh, and also a little bit of a niche business called uh, micro staffing. But more importantly, the primary rationale for doing that was to get access to the Australian market because we were not present in Australia till that time. And what we are seeing now over a period of time uh, is the, uh, a lot of traction uh, for the digital services, a lot of traction opportunities coming up for uh, catering to the UK, sorry, to the Australian public sector, as well as for the traditional BPM business offshoring into India and Philippines. Uh, these things clearly take time. But we are pretty happy with the way both the acquisitions have shaped up so far. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your time and clarifying my questions. And good luck. And thank you for a very interesting question. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, you may please press star and one. We have the next question from the line of Ranga Prasad, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope I'm audible. At the outset, uh, let me say that I'm deeply concerned about the continuing losses of our media division, both on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis as well as on a year-by-year basis. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, we have a roadmap as to by when we can expect this division to turn profitable, or at least where the losses can be spent. It has been reported in the media that uh, Elon Musk's Starlink is also going to be coming to India to offer broadband on satellite. Would this significantly increase the competition to our broadband business? I have certain other questions, but first, if I could get some clarification on this. Sure, uh, Mr. Anupasad, good evening, sir. Good evening. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I'll, I'll be absolutely, so first let me start with your second question first. Um, yeah. So, as far as what you just mentioned about Starlink coming to India, um, there's also Amazon Kuiper who's looking at India. There's OneWeb through uh, Airtel, and there is obviously GOSES, which is there. There'll be others also like Viasat and a couple of other players. I think what these companies need is they need a strong um, partner 
in the country to be able to support them. And I'm not talking about regulatory support. I'm talking about that besides regulatory, there are four key things that any, um, any player requires. Um, the first is a good, strong knowledge of satellite. And um, as you know, we are the only hits player in Asia, and therefore we have experience in satellite. Uh, the second parameter is being able to understand broadband, the packages of broadband. We have, we are in ISP today, India's fourth largest uh, private ISP in the country. Third thing is, um, you would need to have significant penetration in rural India because basically broadband over satellite or satellite internet is, um, is, is targeted greatly at markets which are underserved or unconnected and as you know sir we are present in over 4500 pin codes 65% of our subscriber base comes from semi urban semi rural and rural india including places like the far uh, northeastern reaches of india andaman and nicobar islands uh, where we have a strong presence um, even kargil right and we're very proud of our connectivity in all these places tawang and arunachal pradesh pulwama so and the fourth most important thing is an entire ecosystem uh, of sales to, to installation, to service, to support. And today we have 10,000 uh, franchises across the country, which is about 40,000 feet on the street. We've got our own 1,300 strong task workforce. Um, so with all those factors, we believe that um, we would be in the most suitable position uh, to align with a, a suitor, obviously, given certain preconditions, etc. Um, but I think that what we have done on the terrestrial side and in terms of building a strong infrastructure network, services and platform and Rural Connect, I think we believe that we'll be a strong player in that, probably partnering with one of the big players, sir. So I hope that answers the second question, sir. Certainly, yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, so on your first question, um, as you know, this, this is a significantly challenging industry, and um, we, are, uh, we keep on innovating uh, virtually every year to be able to push things ahead. I think the entire industry faces challenges, uh, is facing challenges, especially the digital distribution in, in the industry. Um, we're the only independent uh, platform left in the country, largest independent platform in terms of a multi-system operator with it. And uh, we believe that this combination that we've built of uh, leveraging our digital television business to grow our broadband uh, will see green shoots. Sir. That much I can assure you. Um, we are facing challenges quarter and quarter, but uh, if you look at the way we've changed the product mix ever since we've come out of the lockdown and consumer preferences have changed, uh, we've not let that uh, you know temper our... Uh, our um, growth, we, we focused on growth. I mean, just if you look at the top line, sir, last year, you know, at this time, I mean, last H1 of FY24, we were clocking about, I think, 500 odd crores in H1. Um, this year, we've touched 608 crores in H1 itself, right? So that's a 22% growth. But your point is valid, sir. The focus is now strictly on profitability. And that is being, that is being harmonized through integrating broadband and the digital television in a much bigger way than probably we did earlier. And given the fact that we've been able to now deal with the onslaught of OTT, customers changing preferences, uh, free, dish, uh, free digital uh, television services. So we believe we're on the right track, sir. See, this lack of profitability has been weighing very heavily on the share price. As you know, today the share price is about 630 or 640. Vis a vis the book value of uh, 1680, that's a discount of over 60%. So clearly, the market is getting to be very concerned about this lack of profitability. I'm just saying that. Uh, yes, you're right. Uh, to be noted. Now, I have some questions on the financials, just more in the form of clarifications. One is the balance sheet shows a goodwill amount of 997 crores. Could you please tell me what it is? Because it's also been increasing. This quarter it has increased from 959 to 997 crores. And is there a plan to amortize this goodwill over a period of time? If so, or how many years? Yeah, thank you. Uh, good question, Sri uh, Let me answer that. 
uh, if you look at between March 24 and um, September 24, there is an increase. Primarily, the two drivers. Uh, one is the uh, Vince talked about it. The Seven Star acquisition which happened during the uh, I think it was in April. So that that there's some goodwill which got created. And rest is actually happening between primarily on the account of FX variation. I think to go back to it a uh, slightly different uh, perspective. These are all uh, goodwill which has got created primarily from the acquisitions which we have made. Goodwill on act, uh, um, goodwill on consolidation. It could be techlink. It could be diversify. It could be the earlier acquisitions as well. And from an accounting standard point of view, these are uh, to be tested for impairment. Uh, otherwise, they remain constant on the balance sheet. Okay. Now, uh, I, I could you give some clarification on your deferred tax assets? They are showing deferred tax assets of 240 crores, and uh, an additional income tax assets of 500 crores. What is the distinction between the two? So some relate to taxes which we have paid and for which we are uh, essentially waiting for the tax refunds, the uh, pending clearances, and this is primarily overseas. Deferred tax is primarily on the uh, you know either uh, you know out of losses which we have incurred in the past on which there is certainty and we have created a deferred tax or normal in case in terms of. Uh, timing differences um, uh, between uh, between time period to period. For instance, in a year, for instance, if you uh, pay, uh, there are some payments due, you can claim a tax rebate only when they are paid rather than on an accrual basis. So those are the others which come from the deferred tax assets. Uh, the next uh, clarification is regarding comprehensive income. They are showing 93.75 crores in this quarter. Could you please uh, throw some light on that, and how it will affect our future uh, net profit? Will it actually have any impact on the profits to be reported in the subsequent quarters? Uh, operationally, you no. Know, this is purely from an accounting treatment. For instance, if I take a forward cover uh, or any hedge, which is um, and the hedges are still valid and have not been impaired. Uh, any mark to market on those hedges would go into the other comprehensive income, and they would come in only in an extreme case. For instance, something has happened and the uh, hedges are ineffective, in which case it would hit your P&L. But normally, there would not be any impact on your profit after tax because they, these are items which go straight to the balance sheet without touching your P&L. Okay. The final question is regarding interest expense. I see that it's going up, even though the uh, revenue has been coming down. Revenue from operations. Is there any particular reason why it's going up? Is it because of the interest rate going up, or is it because the quantum of uh, debt that we have taken has gone up? So multiple things. So one, uh, as I mentioned, between September, between March and September in this year, this is actually. Reduced debt, but this interest expense is a, also has I mean, the two broad drivers. One is any loans which you have taken, on which you have to pay interest. The second part comes from if you have taken any leases, and then the pay you have uh, lease payments, which include the there is a component. Uh, it's a non-cash item, but it shows up as an interest cost and uh, depreciation. And it also includes if I were to take uh, a premise on me under India 16, the rentals are ignored, and then I have to replace it as if I have borrowed money to take to own that particular building, and then I have to charge interest and depreciation on that building, even though I don't own that building. So the more than the cash interest part of it, it's the India 16 accounting part and the lease accounting part, which is driving the uh, increases in interest. Especially if you see the difference between Q2 of FY24 and Q2 of FY25, 
where it has gone up from about 46 crores to 62 crores. Okay. And finally, see, there's been a lot of negative publicity uh, on, a, on the ongoing search and survey assessment going on. In fact, some media reports have said that uh, the burden on the company can be as much as 2,500 crores. Now, the company has not given any clarification on that. So, is there any update on this ongoing search and survey assessment? So, we have been making disclosures as required from Q, I mean, from quarter ending December 23. So, there was a search and survey which happened in November, December last year. And we have received, and again, this disclosure we have updated. Uh, if you see our publication page, uh, there is a show cause notice which has been received. We are in the process of replying to the uh, notice. And uh, so that's where we are, sir. Okay. So no definite so figures have been mentioned. We request you to please return to the queue if you have further questions. Thank you. We have the next question from the line of Anuj Panwar from Family Office. Please go ahead. Yes, hi. Thank you for the opportunity. I just have two questions. So in the BPO business, how do you see the growth in revenue and profitability going forward? And uh, secondly, when are we planning to launch our broadband over satellite offering? Like, does it require further R&D? Uh, just wanted to understand what the status on that. Pala, would you like to take the question on the BPM side first? Yeah. So, uh, thanks, uh, Anuj. Good question. As I mentioned, uh, you know, between we've had challenges primarily from the UK public sector part. Uh, so, we are focusing on the private sector and more on the offshoring. So, the, the South Africa center was primarily set up to drive the higher margin profitable businesses. Uh, the other part is, as Patma mentioned, that uh, we are also for focusing on technology services. We assigned two contracts for clients in North America, uh, where we are offering services beyond the traditional call center, BPO kind of a business. Uh, we, these will scale up um, we expect them to scale up during the year, but the, of the remaining part of the financial year. But the full impact will come only in FY26, uh, in the year starting April of 1st April 25. And we believe these, uh, since they have also a component of uh, offshoring, uh, that would help us, that will help improve our margins in the longer run. You want to take yeah, a question sure, about sure. broadband? Um, Anuj, Anuj um, just to um, tell you, I'm not sure if you would. Um, so a couple of, um, I think it was probably a year ago, Anuj, uh, we already have uh, started providing broadband over satellite solutions using what is called a geostationary satellite, or geo, right? Using the government uh, Insat series, and that is already running. We do, we connect a couple of... Um, uh, solar, uh, sorry, a couple of wind uh, solar farms um, in the country. We've uh, run it in Tawang and Arunachal. Uh, those were tests that were done to see how good the quality would be in terms of education, in terms of uh, using it for communication. Um, we're already running the service, but it is um, it's running very small because it's a geostationary service. The big players that um, uh, even Mr. Ranga Prasad referred to are people like Amazon Koiper and uh, OneWeb from ASL or Starlink who are looking at LEO services or low Earth orbit uh, satellites. That service, in my opinion, will probably come in next year. And um, the, the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, which is the regulator for our industry, um, has in fact uh, gone on records stating that they would come out with a pricing structure, etc., by December 15th this year. I'm talking about barely a few weeks away from here. So we believe by the end of middle to of next year or so, we'll start seeing LEO tests happening in the country. Um, we, we hope to see that. So we're happy to kind of bolt on at any point in time, Anuj. 
I hope that answers your question, Anuj. Yeah, that answers my question. Thank you. That was helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take that as our last question for today. I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Partha Desarkar for closing comments. Over to you, sir. Partha, you're probably on mute. We can't hear you. Yeah, can you hear me now? Okay. Now we can hear you, Partha. Go on. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, listening to us in our Q2 earnings conference call, and we look forward to talking to you again in February when we bring up our Q3 numbers. All the best, and good night. Thank you. On behalf thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank On you. behalf of Hinduja Global Solutions Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you all for joining us. You may now disconnect your lines. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.